Hi, good afternoon everyone. It's uh, great to be here once again. Uh, last year I was here and I, and I think the team that has organized this whole thing, it's not easy. Uh, I think they deserve another round of applause. So please. Thank you. It, it's always um, very interesting to find out uh, what really goes on to a lot of the things that we do in our life. One of my favorite games, how many of, how many of us play chess here? Okay, all right, that's great. It's one of those games that is full of techniques, strategies, and um, uh, there's too much, uh, there's kind of like a mind game going on. And this is one of my favorite game because it was, uh, my, my wife taught me how to play this. I mean, trust me, yeah, she beats me all the time. Uh, uh, and the only reason why I got inspired to play this game was because of my elder brother, who, who was really a fantastic player. For whatever reason, he just refused to teach me. Uh, but before I start on my topic about my relationship with ego, uh, allow me to start off with a story that I've read some time back. Um, there was once a man who approached uh, Buddha and he asked to Buddha, Buddha, I want to know uh, how to be happy. So I want happiness. So Buddha said, it's very easy. The story stops there for now. All right. And I'll continue with my presentation proper. Many of us have, uh, we take a lot of thoughts, a lot of thoughts go through our head on, on an everyday basis. Studies have shown us that we take about 60,000 to, 60, to 80,000 thoughts per day. And out of that, a good 80% actually seems to be negative. And I wonder what has happened to us that a lot of our thoughts are, seems to be negative. And with that, I decided to, met, uh, to meet um, a researcher from uh, Nanyang Technological University, NTU. Uh, and she does a lot of research in terms of language. And she shared with me, uh, Benz, do you know that between the age of zero to three, if you introduce as many languages as possible to a child, the child will really pick up all the languages. So the child could be bilingual, the child could be like, you know, uh, trilingual, you name it, it's possible. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. How, how, how is that possible? And she said, yes, the brain has that capacity to do that. And that got me to think, to think about, uh, uh, because I'm trained in the area of counseling and psychology, it got me to think, okay, like, then where do we learn this concept called ego? Yeah. What is ego and where did it learn it from? Is it an innate thing for all of us? You mean the moment we are born, we have it? Or is it something that we have learned from our family, what we have seen and everything? Not really, really sure. Then I went on to Google, you know, I got my best friend Google, and I said, hey Google, tell me what's ego? And it says the word I. Ego comes, stands from the word I. Me, myself, and I. I think this is what should be done. I think this is what I will be doing. This is what I feel. Therefore, I separate myself from the rest of the community, because I am bigger than everybody else. Then it got me to think, OK, if it's I, where did this I come from? Then I referred to my old textbooks. And guess who I met? Sigmund Freud. OK, those of you guys who read psychology, you guys will know who Sigmund Freud is, uh, the, the man who is definitely defined as uh, the father of psychology, father of counseling, and psychotherapy, and so on and so forth. And he believes that um, all, there, there is this three portions in us, uh, which is it, ego, and superego. It being like a child, which is probably um, very young, below seven years old, would always say, I want this, I want that, I want because I feel this way. Whereas the superego probably practices like a parent, a critical parent, and it will say that, uh, no, you shouldn't be doing this, no. You shouldn't be feeling this way. No, you shouldn't do this kind of things. So therefore, it sounds like a critical parent in, in certain aspects. And therefore, the ego, which is in the middle, sound kind of like creates the balance between these two uh, stages and said, hey, you know what, guys? Let's 
let's have a bit of balance, right? Let's not quarrel. And of course, Sigmund Freud went on to talk about uh, the unconscious and the, uh, and the conscious mind and, things of, and so on and so forth. Now, as we are talking about ego, I started off talking about my brother. In fact, he's my late brother. He's passed on a few years ago. He was actually 12 years my senior. He was very much, short of a better word to put it, he was definitely, was, he was almost like a hero to me at all times. Whatever he was doing, I wanted to do because we were very, very close. But of course, there are certain things that we disagreed upon. I mean, we agreed to disagree upon, but, uh, but generally, we were pretty tight. And sometime in 1990, I remember I had a lot of hair back then. <laughs> back then, <laughs> all right? And I was only 15 years old, and anyway, so 15, so my brother was like 12 years my senior. Um, he was 27, and we had a huge disagreement. Really, it was really, really bad. We had a huge disagreement over $15. Not much. It was just $15. Probably if I go down today someplace, I'll spend that $15 very quickly. If I park my car in this place for one whole day, probably I'll be paying more than $15. <laughs> right? Yeah, but it was a huge disagreement. We quarreled over it again and again and again. It went on for a while. And then at the age of 15, I decided I will no longer talk to him. And yes, I did that. I refused to speak to him. I refused to associate myself with him. Whatever he likes, I will purposely not like it. Simple example, he's a big fan of the soccer team Liverpool. I purposely chose to be a fan of Man United. Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense at all. Actually, I like Liverpool to a certain extent. But because he likes Liverpool, I said, no, I'll choose Man U. The, the rival. And so it, it went on like that. Uh, I, I, I don't want to, when he's having his lunch or dinner, I don't want to be there with him. And it went on for a while. But life took, to, as we grew older, life took us to different stages. Uh, and he had, he made some mistakes. And therefore, he was really down and out. out. He was really down and out. And my mom came to me and she said, Ben, it's okay. Give him a chance. You know, his end of the day, he is your brother. You know, whether you like it or you don't like it, $15 is nothing much, you know, let's like, forget about it. And I said, okay, should I or shouldn't I? You know, kind of like a Shakespeare kind of thing, you know, to be or not to be, you know, kind of thing. So it went on for a while in my head. So I decided to consult my two friends. Uh, they have been with me since my childhood days. Some of you may have known them, some may not. I decided to talk to my two friends. One is Pinky, another is Brain. All right? Pinky is a very emotional person, and he said, no, it's OK. And he, Pinky told me the same thing. He said, you know what? It's OK. He's your brother. Give him a chance. Let, let's, let's forget about it. But of course, Brain said, no, cannot. You were right. He was wrong. So how can you give him a chance? And after that whole tussle you know, in, in, in my brain, that, that explains why I lost all my hair, yeah? So, all right? No, they could never find balance. They refused to find balance because brain was a lot stronger, a lot sharper. So he, I listened to him. And therefore, brain took over my whatever I was thinking. I refused to talk. I said, no, it's not going to happen. I will not talk to him. I refused my mom. I said, no, mom, I'm not going to talk to him. He's your son. Let him be your son. But I am not going to talk to him because he's no longer my brother. Over what? Over $15. Like, really, yeah. Then, because my mom said so, you know, I, I, because I really love my mom, and I said, OK, mom, because you said so, um, I will talk to him. And my conversation was with him. I think I was kinder to, to the guy who cleans uh, my block than to my own brother, really. Uh, um, I, it was very much like a patronizing kind of thing. I was like, hey, hi, hello, hello. That's about it. Whenever we had family gathering, I'll, I'll be there. But when the moment he appears, I will find some reason, some reason to leave the place. So this went on for a while. And sometime in, 
in, uh, and I think, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, there were many times he actually approached my mom and said, why is he behaving this way? And, and my mom said, you know about him, right? He's like that. You know, he can be very stubborn, and this way he is really, really stubborn. Uh, so there's nothing much I could do. Uh, I suppose he was sad, but he just didn't know how to connect, and I refused to connect because my doors were not shut. It was shut, locked, and cemented at the same time. So there's no way he could, there was entry for him. And sometime, I still remember, sometime in year 2004, and I still remember I was at work, I received a call, uh, picked up my handphone, and, I, and my mom was on the other line. Uh, her, her voice was pretty shaky, and she was almost tearing. And, uh, and she said, she said uh, Ben, I just received news uh, that your brother has passed on. In a, he, was, he was killed in a road traffic accident uh, in Malaysia. And my immediate response was, uh, no, it can't be him. He's, he's, a, he's very much quite, quite safe. You know? Yeah, he, he can be reckless, but generally he's, he's quite safe. You know? he, he, he'll be good. It can't be him. Yes, very much I was in, in denial, and I said, no, that's not possible. My mom said, no, it seems it's him, because they seem to be, the police seems to have his passport. And I said, okay, all right. Um, no, never mind, we, we will go down the next day. So I decided, then the next day, we drove into Malaysia. We were there at the mortuary. Up to the point when I was stepping into the mortuary, I really told my mom, Mom, you know what, guess what, it can't be him. It won't be him. You know, trust me, probably tomorrow he's going to give us a call and he's going to tell us that uh, he was safe and he, everything is fine. My mom really sensed that I was very much in the, in the denial stage of the griefing process. Um, and when we went in, or rather, when I stepped in, yes, he was there. He was lying down on this metal-like table thing, lifeless, cold, no movement, nothing. It was very quiet. It was really, really very quiet. And at that point, I am someone that my mom always would say that I don't tear very easily. Even my mom said, even my father passed on, I, I, I didn't tear, I, I hold, I'm, I can come across as very tough. But at that point, I broke down. Everyone who was there was surprised to see me crying. They were more shocked that I was crying because I really cried. I've never cried so much in my life. I really cried. And every tear that streamed down my cheeks if only they could speak, they would have only said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my brother, that I shouldn't have done all those things that I did to you. It was not right. Was I right because of the contextual part of things? Because of that $15? Maybe I was right. But was it an appropriate thing? I really wonder. I really cried, and I do miss him. Every, this isn't a single day that I go by thinking about him and thinking about what I have done to him. At that point, it made a lot, a lot of sense what Pinky was trying to tell me, that relationship is a lot more important than listening to ego or brain. But yes, but I choose to listen to ego, right? And yes, and we did whatever he, we need to be done. He, he was buried and things of sorts. But then again, he has left a void in my life. He was my best friend even before I was born. He was there for everything in my life. My good times, my bad times, my worst times, he's been there. But when he needed me, I was not there. I just chose to give in to ego. And if my brother could hear me right now, this is something that I will definitely share with him. You are my guide. You inspired me in every field. When problems tried to reach me, you protected me like a shield, and you helped me to be a better person. Not only do I miss you, I love you a lot. And I really truly hope that if his soul could hear me, he could hear what I'm just sharing about him. Ego is just a three-letter word. Interestingly, it has the ability 
and the potency to severe any form of relationship. This is a 12-letter word. It's, it's very unique, isn't it? Right? I, I urge all of us in this room to, to take a moment to think about to the, mo to the time where we have actually given in to ego and severed the, or, or, or disconnected the relationship that has meant to us very dearly. Think about it. Is it worth it? Allow me to share with you from my own personal experience. It was never worth it. It was never, never worth it. Ego, ego is no longer there. So what? Ego is never there now. But now that I want to connect with my brother, I want to tell him all those things. I want to foster a relationship with him, but he's not there, right? My relationship with him is very much spiritual in terms of in my thoughts. He's just living in my thoughts at this point of time. I, can't, I could speak to him, but I can't, he can't tell me whatever he's thinking about. Right? So let's ask ourselves, is it as important to be correct or is it a lot more important to build a relationship? It is good to be correct, but it's okay to build the relationship because that will keep us going. Now, allow me to conclude the story that I started with from, from Buddha. When the man asked Buddha, Buddha, I want happiness. Tell me how to do it. Buddha was very quick and he said, there's only two things you need to do. First, take away the word I. Probably Buddha was talking about ego. Then he said, take away, take away the word want, the desire. He said, then you have nothing but happiness. I suppose in this context, Buddha was talking about happiness is in terms of relationship. Building the relationship with people, with the people beside us, the people with our family. Because relationship makes us to be better people. Relationship makes us human. And in many instances, I truly, truly believe that relationship keep us, or rather makes us, to be an immortal. Let's go back home. As today when you're going back home, think about it. What are the relationships that we have sidelined? And is it time for us to put aside the ego and to rebuild the relationship? Thank you so much for listening to me and my story. I am Bernard.